Hello and welcome to Brimwood Farm. Here in Suffolk, England, it's midsummer and the flower farm is in full bloom and the vegetables in the garden are really coming on. Lambing is over, piglets are growing, kidding has finished. We've still got a few chicks on the way, but mostly the farm is now teeming with wildlife. And it's as it should be. My grand plan's here to rewild the entire site and show how you can farm high welfare animals alongside regenerative uh, practices are on the way. And this field is one of those sort of examples. I mean, I don't know if you can hear it, but the grasshoppers And this field is where I pasture rotate the sheep and I have the chickens and it's absolutely full. Butterflies, bees, grasshoppers, everywhere you walk things are leaping out of the way. It's utterly wonderful. And this fields and all of the amazing grass and thistles and dock and all of that plant life where the sheep haven't been grazed is rather stark contrast to where the sheep were grazed, which is here. And you can see instantly barren. There's some insects in there, but mostly barren. Ungrazed, grazed. Now the plan of course with this rotational system was to have these smaller paddocks and move them on every week into the next pen so nothing ever ended up like this. The problem was of course my sheep decided to have no respect for the electric fencing and just went straight through it and it also didn't work particularly well. I was trying to get the electric to run through all of the lines, one battery around the entire fence, and it didn't work. It just couldn't, it couldn't cope with the current. Um, so we have taken a new step to try and retrain them. So yesterday I put in a new paddock and you can see this is what it should be like with the sheep down in the grass, trampling, grazing, eating. And what I've done is I've set up poly wire, but I've put poly wire around the entire thing. I haven't connected to it to any of the other paddocks. So we've just got one current going through the whole system. And so far, the only one that has got out is this girl here. And she doesn't want to go back in. That means the current is working. The, the normal instigators of escaping are in. Um, so I definitely think this is the way forward to go. Going forward, I think what it means is I need to redo all of my paddocks and rather have one full line around the entire thing. Still have this system of uh, separate little paddocks, but each paddock has its own separate uh, current of polywire. So I can move the battery each time to just that paddock and it will just do a full circuit. And I think with that, we won't have so many issues. And you can see here that even though there is some poop to uh, embellish the soil and, and dung beetles and stuff can come along, and there's a bit of grass, there's no sound. There's no insects. It's fairly barren. We pop over the fence to the one that we set up yesterday. And you can already hear all of the bugs. One of my ewes also got fly strike, and so I've just sheared off her back end. And you can see all the maggots as they're dying. But again, I do find with the longer grass, they get away from the flies. 
yeah, they are exposed. There's nowhere for them to go. But in the longer grass, you can see they're hunkered down and the flies don't find them as much. So it works for better welfare as well as better grounds, better soil, better pasture. And they love it. This was also quite an exciting week for Christmas. No, not that Christmas. But Christmas, my turkey, who survived because I got COVID just before Christmas and so I didn't eat him. So um, Christmas is in here and you can see here, they are not Christmas. Christmas has ladies. So Christmas is a Norfolk black uh, stag and I picked him up three Norfolk black hens. He's not the best stag going and he shouldn't have any of this white barring on him. But he's become, he's become a friend. I like him. So uh, I can raise, I raise his chicks, crossing him with these Norfolk black hens, uh, which are how they should look. And uh, we'll see what we get. I've also moved my two young ram lambs out into these corner paddocks um, from the barn. I decided I'm not going to show them. I'm not going to actually probably show any more this year. It's just a faff. It's a faff. It's, it's too much work and it doesn't fit with my ethos. My ethos is native rare breeds in a rewilding scheme. To get animals ready for show, you have to keep them in, you have to trim them, you have to pump them full of food so they look big and hefty. That's completely at odds with my natural foraging. So I'm not going to do any more showing. Um, it was fun, it was fun that one time, uh, but it's not for me. So the ram lambs are out here. Hello boys. And over here is where we did have I don't know whether she'll be out today, but there was a very pregnant common lizard living under this piece of corrugated steel. Oh, there's the most beautiful butterfly there. Especially in summer, I spend half my life getting sidetracked by insects and bugs and critters. I mean, you just look across here in this, this hedge, it doesn't look like there's anything. But if you stop and start to watch, there's butterflies, there's bees. I mean, look over here. Man, I love nature. So right behind where our common lizard lives, I've just spotted this. Caterpillars. If you ever see webbing on nettles or lots of little black dots on the top of the nettle leaves, it's worth having a little investigate because it might be caterpillars of tortoiseshell or peacock peacock or red admiral butterflies. These look like they are tortoiseshell, I think. They're not peacock, they might be tortoiseshell or red admiral, I think they're tortoiseshell. Um, but they're great, they, I've seen a hell of a lot of butterflies around this year and that's really, really fabulous. Normally if they were a smaller stage, I would collect them, grow them on in a tank and then release them all um, to try and save as many as possible because when they're out in the wild, they'll get eaten, they also get parasitized. Uh, these, these ones, too far gone, they're almost adults, so I might as well just leave them be.
I was pretty worried uh, at the beginning of the year by last year's drought and the lack of water in the pond. Um, but nature has a funny way of knowing what she's doing because what happened this year is it dried out so much that I think a lot of seeds, uh, aquatic plant seeds, that have been stuck in the seed bed under, you know, mud upon mud upon mud, because it then dried out and then as the water slowly filled up, it brought all those seeds back out. And what's happened is it's regenerated to a, a way that I've never seen many of these plants in this pond. When I first moved, back up here and started to cut these ponds back, I basically thought I would have to reintroduce all this natural aquatic uh, plant life because it wasn't there. What I've discovered is nature actually does it for you. So there's loads of water mint, there's loads of water plantain um, here that's come up all by itself. And that's allowed the pond to begin thriving again with loads of bugs and wildlife. I forget sometimes to just sit and just perched in this pond just watching. It's magical. Um, there's also a wren flitting back and forth over there and uh, he or she had a huge great caterpillar in their mouth. They've gone into the bushes and then I heard babies. So it's rather magical. I've also just spotted, there's been some footage of hoverflies that I've shown you. And just sitting here and looking at this reed, this here, that's a hoverfly pupa, which is rather amazing. And then look, I wonder what this is. There's a shape. What are you? What are you? You're a cluster of weird bugs. I've just got out of the pond and look, I've been accompanied by, where is she? This moth. But what I thought we'd do is wander down to the wildflower meadow because while there is a lot of life here, uh, this has been obviously browsed and grazed. Um, the wildflower meadow, <laughs> it blows my mind with the amount of stuff there is. Um, so let's have a little wander down there. We'll go past the little piglets. Even, even here, right next to the flower farm, just an abundance. And the thistles, here we can literally, I can literally show you. Oh, that's the peacock. Sorry, see you again, getting sidetracked. Beautiful tortoise shell, enjoying some food. There is a peacock butterfly there. Where is she there? Hello. Hello, sweetie. You doing well? Her sisters are in there. Well, I didn't manage to catch it on film, but there, in the space of that small section down there, there was a red admiral, a peacock butterfly, and that beautiful tortoise shell. Look at this. And actually there goes a meadow brown flitting amongst it. Um, many people, many farmers, see this and just weep. I see it and just think it's fabulous. Imagine, imagine the pigs rustling through here, just doing their thing. And the goats, I mean, the goats would absolutely adore it. This is why this year, this winter, I'm really going to look into funding options for the boundary fencing. I would really love if next year we could start the rewilding properly in terms of letting the animals out. Because of, the, of course this is all rewilding. We're letting it go back to, the, to Mother Nature and, and the wild. But we, humans, 
have basically destroyed all of the natural landscape animals. So they need this needs grazers um, to create the, and, and change the habitat to what they need. Otherwise, it will end up just being scrub because nothing will come along. Nothing will root through the earth and overturn uh, soil and the seedbed. Nothing will chomp down trees at the edge of um, forests and things. Nothing will stand and squish on brambles and scrub. We need that. So this winter, this autumn winter, that's my, that's my plan. Find grants, funding to do all of the fencing. But I, th I love this field. I love it. Other farmers may think it's horrendous, but um, I see it as the way forward. So there is a peacock. Here are two red admirals. And here, are another three peacock butterflies. One. Two. Three. So here we are. This is the wildflower meadow and woodland field. <laughs> I say that with a laugh because where I've tried to put trees, they haven't survived and the deer's got them. That's down there. Where I haven't put trees, nature. Nature, nature, nature. There's the bird hide there on the right. She's gone, no, I want, I want to do ash trees here. So she's done ash trees here. I love it. <laughs> I, really, I love it. Just, just leave it, just leave it alone. Here's some destruction you can see from deer where they have come along and, and taken the bark off. This ash has managed to survive, but I will show you some of the trees I put in. The smaller trees have, have fared quite, quite well. I suppose because as all of the grass and the weeds and the thistles and the Dorcas grew up, kind of shielded them. The larger trees that I got, which really were a statement to start with, you can see are utterly dead. Now that's not because no water, that's because deer have stripped off the bark. It's frustrating, but we're working with wildlife and um, as you can see nature is deciding where she wants trees. She wants trees over there. She wants to leave this bit more open. Um, I, always forget, I think this is sneezeweed. I really love it when it comes out. It just has this blaze of yellow and you can see that it does attract quite a few butterflies. I love, and I love this patch. I love it. I love how all of these ash have just come up and interspersed with them is the Dorcas. Isn't it pretty? It looks like the white, are there just sort of clouds just floating amongst these trees that have done their own thing. Now, most of the wildflowers are actually over now. It starts off with, oh, Oh, one of my silkies. I lost a load of silkies the other day. Here's one. Interesting that she was brought this way, so it might not be my foxes. It might be foxes from over there. There's a lot of anthills in here as well. I just stepped over another one. Um, but yeah, it starts with the uh, ragged robin. It turns to the ox eyes. And here they are, they, you can see they are, they're going over now. And actually, if I do this, all that seed. And then it turns, so it turns white with the oxides. Then it turns yellow with the um, ladies' bed straw. So named because ladies used to pluck it and stuff their mattresses and pillows with it another huge ant mound 
here it is, because it smells of honey. It's beautiful stuff. Of course, I wish we had smell vision because it smells divine. It smells of honey. So a J in the background. And my hives are here. Oh my gosh. All of this. Look at it. Look at it. Oh, and another ant hive. Oh, and a cinnabar moth. Lovely. Wish I could have caught that. Cinnabar moths are divine little creatures. Jewels. Um, but here are the hives. Another little patch of thistles. And once again, peacock butterfly, meadow brown, a trillion zillion soldier bugs. Oh, and a comma. Oh, again, a marvelous, beautiful butterfly. Honestly, doesn't it just show how important thistles are? <laughs> we need to leave our thistles alone. So I hope this has shown you a little bit more of the farm and insights into my dream, um, the rewilding dream. And also to show that you don't have to do it massive scale. I've got 37 acres. I know to many people that seems a vast amount, but some rewilding schemes are on thousands of acres. Um, but if we had lots of smaller farmers on smaller patches of land doing this and a network across the entire country, it would be amazing. And you can still grow food. I've still got lamb. I've still got pig. I will hopefully this year, this autumn, again, it depends on all of the boundary fencing, but I am looking at getting cattle. I've still got all the poultry. I've got a flower farm. I've got a market garden, which is supplying vegetables to my CSA customers and to my farmers markets. So we can still produce food while protecting the land and nature and giving back. Um, and I get personal huge amount of joy from it as you've probably seen as i've been walking around and finding see i can't stop looking <laughs> i can't stop looking because everything mo things move and i'm like oh bug 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 butterfly bug bug spider bug i love it i adore it um i hope you adore it too and i hope you can do some rewilding at home let a patch go leave some thistles leave some nettles Yes, it looks unsightly to some people. I, I don't think it looks unsightly. I, I see nature. But also, if we don't leave those thistles and we don't leave those nettles and we don't leave that nature, eventually there will be no nice gardens because we'll all be dead <laughs> because we will have killed the world. That's my preach a bit over. Anyway, I'm going to go and water. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one. Well, that's soft cooing up there. That's a turtle dove, folks. They're very timid. I won't be able to get any closer to get a good photo. And it's not to be surprised, really, since most of them are shot when they fly over to England. I don't blame them for being a little bit timid. But um, I'm wondering whether I've got a pair this year because normally they naff off. They come, they, they purr, in May and June, and then they disappear. Well, I've had two. I've had actually three. And now I've got one male that purrs, and there's another one around. I think they might have a nest. He's shifted and he's purring somewhere else, but oh, it's just divine.